Hey everyone, check out our interview with Ryan Reese with the Whosoever's about Calvary Chapel and their revival nights. Hello. Hi, is this Ryan? Yes. Hi Ryan, this is uh, Joy with Calvary Chapel Magazine. Hello again. How are you doing? Doing good. How about you? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for uh, calling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to just start off with some prayer? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Lord Jesus, um, forgive us of our sins. Um, go before us in this conversation, Lord, and just highlight what you want to highlight. Mm-hmm. And um, thank you, Lord, for uh, this opportunity. And thank you for Calvary Chapel Magazine continuing to Press on and um, just let everyone know what's what's going on in the movement. All the all the amazing things that you've been doing for the last sixty years, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I think sixty five years actually. Wow, that's amazing. Since Chapel Chapel started. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I watched um, the Jesus Movement movie with a or the Jesus Revolution movie with some of my friends last year, and they're not affiliated with Calvary Chapel, and they're like, wow, that's actually really amazing. So it's a, it's a I great know. church. We, we have such a cool heritage, but it's been, it's been so long. So that, that movie was actually really good timing for, for it to come out and kind of show, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of give a background of, of what all happened and stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, heck yeah. So, Brian, do you want to kind of just tell me about these revival nights, kind of your vision with it, how you've seen the Lord moving them? I know that you guys had your Golden Springs revival night already. Can you want to just tell me a little bit how that went? Yeah, totally. Let me pull, let me pull one thing up really quick. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. One thing on my computer here, just so I can uh, read this one verse. Oh, uh, where is it? Here we go. Boom. Boom. Okay. All right, cool. So about, I don't know, maybe like a couple of years ago, I just, uh, I started sensing to do uh, some kind of a, an event uh, within the Calvary Chapel movement, because like we were talking about, you know, we know that the, the movement has been going on for about 65 years now. We know about the tent revival and, and all the amazing stuff that has actually come from that. Um, just looking back at the roots of Calvary Chapel, you see, you know, all these these guys that were kind of like outcasts that that got saved, you know, even from my dad. My dad never did drugs, but yeah. he was, you know, anger, mm-hmm. you know, fighting. And then you have Mike McIntosh story, Jeff Johnson. You have all these these guys that that God got a hold of their lives and he used them through his grace in, in into uh, use them in a powerful way and you see the effects of what Chuck did and then these 12 guys expanding to a global movement, right? And um, as God got a hold of my life kind of the same way out of like the drugs and the alcohol and pornography and, and just a very radical conversion as well, um, God led me to go do outreaches to the the world, to the public schools, to the high schools, to the music festivals, to it's all everything I do is 100 percent outreach, outreach of, of the church. Yeah. But then, two years ago, God um, uh, started leading me to do something within the church because I came across that verse in Matthew six twenty two, and I and I've read this verse I don't know how many times, obviously, but but this last two years ago I read it and it says. Jesus said, the eye is a lamp to the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body is full of darkness. And if then that light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And literally, it it just hit me because the amount of stories that I've heard from kids within the church or even adults in the church that come to me that are struggling with pornography or they're struggling with, you know, they're having you know, supernatural events and things happening uh, in their room with demonic presence or or different things or depression, anxiety, and all, all this stuff that's happening with them. God really expanded this verse to me and showed me that people are struggling not only in the church, but outside the church because of 
what they're putting in to their eyes. Because Jesus says, if your eye's good, your whole body's good. But if your eye's bad, your whole body is bad. And we know that Jesus also talks about good fruit and bad fruit of a tree. And that mm-hmm. and the fruit is the actions. So what God revealed to me through this verse is that we have a church globally of kids that are getting eaten up alive and adults because we live in a time with screen time that is so heavy and so powerful and uncensored, if you will, or even packaged to kids to be dark, that we are now seeing a global epidemic of mental health. And the mental health is just basically the demonic realm of supernatural um, possession and oppression in the culture. And that's why God was leaning, like showing me I didn't hear his voice or anything like that, but I felt like he was leading me to do something within the church because the church, I believe, is more unhealthy than ever before. And I just know from my past of coming out of a very crazy, dark past um, that the struggle is real still as me walking with God and navigating through screen time and just what we're seeing on TV or songs that are being played on the radio. I mean, imagine growing up in this culture of getting bombarded by this stuff. It is super hardcore, super gnarly. And this is why I started the revival night is to do it as a, an an in reach within the church. Cause I'm, again, I always do stuff outside of the church, but I wanted to come into the Calvary chapel movement and do something for the churches to be able to invite people their friends and their family members to come to, to an event um, with, within the church. And that personally, that's very unique for me to do that because I only do stuff outreach outside of the church. Um, but that's what God led me to do. Yeah. So I stepped out in faith. I told my mom about the idea on, on her bedside before she passed a couple of weeks before she passed. And, um, She prayed for me that God would anoint me for this next generation to reach people and that people would come to Revival Night and that they would encounter God and they would never be the same. And that's kind of the whole backstory of why we started, why I started the Revival Night. Wow, that's that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, And I was watching your your video last night, um, just kind of you talking about how the Revival Night went with the Golden Springs Church and just hearing the testimonies of the people who got saved and gave their life um, or got baptized. It just, I think that that really shows, like you said, that the church, the church also needs Christ more than ever. And so it's not just people outside of the church. Um, So I know from, for my life also, I've, I've realized that. So I just really appreciate that. Um, Would you guys say that the intended audience then is that for youth? I know you do a lot of youth events is that kind of for people inside the church? What would you say? Do you have an intended audience for that or not really? So so we, <laughs> this is the other thing. I, I do a lot of youth, young youth stuff, but I, but I also teach a lot of Sunday mornings. I got my dad's church in different Calvaries or different churches all over. So, so I've, I, I, I think people feel like I'm more youth driven, but I know the, the audience is all ages. So for this particular event, I said, this is an all age event. Everyone's invited. So it's marketed for all ages. And yeah, the turnout, we, we, um, we, the, 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 the sanctuary was immediately filled. The overflow was filled and then we had hundreds outside. So we, we had, we, we had probably double the amount of people that could even fit in the sanctuary, um, come out. And the reason why I say that is because you see the need. People are hungry. And we did have action sports out in the parking lot, which was a cool, fun demonst- an action sports demonstration and food trucks and a DJ just for people to kind of hang out in the parking lot. We, we did that. So people, even though it was an in-reach within the church, because they were not fooling anyone, it's not a – it's not literally an, like an out, outreach is outside the church. In reach is it within the church. That's the way I look at things. But I did have that outreach component in the parking lot. So then people can invite their friends and kids and like, hey, they're going to have action sports. 
But then it's a revival night. It's a church event. It's it's revival means to be awakened, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that are that have so much darkness in them because the eyes to the a lamp to their body that they're full of darkness that they need to be an awaken by Jesus Christ and the mm -hmm. whole and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So yes, we 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 had a, a, a more than we anticipated people showing up at, at the events where people were actually had all, we had to fill, fill the the back walls were full of people leaning up against the walls and then people were sit, sitting on the floor as well wow. uh, in the halls and in front of the stage. That's amazing. I yeah. think that just shows also like the true that it's really the Holy Spirit working in that. You know, I saw something the yeah. other day that's like. Jesus, you can't, you can't, um, advertise for a fire. And it's like, that's how Jesus was, you know, everywhere he went, people just came to hear his teachings. And so I think that this, this show is a demonstration of the Holy Spirit really, really working. Um, I saw in your video that you did a talk on light and darkness. And I know that you kind of mentioned that with the verse, do you plan to have like the same teaching for every revival night that you guys are going to do? No, I don't really have any plans um, on what I want to do yet. <laughs> I'm just kind of, uh, just trying to figure out being sensitive to the Holy spirit of what, what messages should be taught in which, which areas. Yeah. Um, I do know that the theme and, uh, you know, my, the theme and all my, anything I teach, I guess always is always the light and the darkness. Right. Um, because I believe 100% more than ever, even in America, as you know, um, there is a serious battle of light and darkness. So I will always expose the two extremes because I can't tell you how many, I mean, I was just with, uh, not just with, but I was with some kid, two 12 year olds and a 13 year old girls. And one was identifying as pansexual and they all three were saying they were having demonic entities showing up mm -hmm. into their rooms. Um, I uh, tested a demon out of a 12 year old, 11 year old girl up in Idaho Falls at the at the big Calvary Chapel up there that has a Christian school. Um, I was there with the, the lead pastor and the principal. Um, the darkness has invaded. So there, I will always address light and darkness, mm -hmm. the the power of God and the demonic realm, no matter what, because that is where we're at, which is interesting because you read about Jesus in the Gospels and you're like, why is this guy, oh, this guy's coming across so many demon-possessed people, not even like, uh, not only adults, but young kids. Mm -hmm. um, we are living in those times now in America, which is shocking for us. And I don't, I, I was raised in Calvary Chapel. I don't believe everyone has a demon in them by any means. But yeah. we are seeing more demonic activity with young kids than ever before. There was even a, a Calvary Chapel pastor up here in Emmett, in a, in a country town, in Emma, Idaho, and he cast a demon of a nine-year-old kid the other day, and he was telling me about it mm. at, at his vacation Bible school. So we are living a very interesting time. So the message, I'm going to leave it open to the Holy Spirit to show me what he wants me to teach at each one. Yeah. Um, but we are definitely going to be hitting the difference between light and darkness always. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm kind of just curious um, because, like you said, I, I feel like this is – this time of seeing demonic oppression is it's, it's happening a lot in America. What does that kind of look like? I know that you said that, um, that these kids kind of just told you that they had demonic oppression going on in their, their room. Is that okay. most of the cases kind of, can you want to just tell me how that works a I, little bit? A absolutely. I got a story for you. So, so basically, um, there's a lot of, uh, me, uh, here, I'm gonna, let me pull up this name of these shows i'm going to give you a couple of names of some shows but there's there's many um let me see statistics let's see so to do one second um i probably now i can't even find um no it's in trash here we go uh demonic game okay so the here's some names um five nights at freddy's I believe it's a not only a TV show, but everything's kind of connected. It's like TV show, uh, video game, et cetera, you know, or movie. They, that's kind of how they do things. So mm -hmm. Five Nights at Freddy's, Poppy Playtime, and Rainbow Friends. 
they all have like fun names, but literally they're like, these are like cartoons that are like deformed and demonic kind of like, um, characters. It's, uh, so, so these, there was a parent at revival night that walked up to me and she said, Hey, you know, that demonic stuff that you guys are, that you're talking about. Um, it was a dad and the wife. They said that demonic stuff that you you were talking about from the stage. She said, see my son right here. He's nine years old and see my daughter. She's seven years old. She says that they have, my son has been drawing all these demonic creatures. And then they started looking into what these demonic creatures that he was drawing. And then they started realizing it was these video games and these TV shows he's been watching that they haven't been paying attention to. Well, nevertheless, that seven year old girl and that nine year old kid has started seeing demons in their room, showing up in their rooms and looking out their closets and up in their windows and, and they've been seeing and feeling demonic presence running around their house and they were coming to their room and crying and asking their parents. So their parents had to get rid of all the games, get all that wipe all the stuff off their pads and pray over the house. Mm. And the mom started even seeing the demonic stuff even previously to them, to the kids seeing it. So they said exactly what you're and I said, Well what what I and I go, Well, what are these games and these 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 TV shows and the stuff they're watching? They said Five Nights at Freddy's Poppy Playtime and Rainbow Friends. And you could just Google these names. And I would put this in the article for people to Google. Just look at these creatures. Mm-hmm. And and they, they look completely demonic. And that's just hitting the top tip of the iceberg right now. So that's a seven-year-old girl and a nine-year-old boy seeing demonic stuff in the room. So we're even taking it younger. Mm-hmm. Then I was up in Idaho Falls uh, speaking at the Calvary Chapel up there, Water Springs. And they have a big Christian school up there. And I did a, the next day I did a lunch assembly, um, or not a lunch assembly. I did like a a chapel. And at the end, I I called everyone forward to pray over them. And if they wanted to give their life to Christ or, or get filled with the spirit. And then after this young girl walked up to me, she was 11 years old. And she said, um, she says she came with all of her friends and she was crying, a little blonde, cute girl. Like she reminded me of one of my daughters. And she said, will you pray for me? Um, I don't feel God's presence. And I said, I just pray for everyone. What are you talking about? I go, why don't you feel God's presence? And she says, well, my mom and dad said I have a demon in me. And I said, well, do you feel like something takes over your body ever? She says, yes. And I said, well, what do you do when that presence takes over your body? She says, I start cutting myself. And then I thought of the story, the demoniac. The demoniac would be Mm demon-possessed and he would cut himself, right? We know that story. Yeah. So what did Jesus do in that story? What's your name, unclean spirit, right? Mm -hmm. He called it forward and the demon manifested and said, legion. So I looked at the the principal and I looked at the senior pastor and I said, do you want me to call, do you want me to cast this demon out here or do you want to go in the back room? And they said, do it right now here in in the sanctuary. So I said, what's your name, unclean spirit? It manifests. And then I cast the demon out and she got set free and she's never been the same. And the principal and the pastor said she's been fine uh, ever since. Um, so that's that's another story of a young kid um, getting the demon casted out of them. Um, I mean, I got there's a 15 year old girl at my dad's church that was. Um, you know, open herself to uh, uh, drugs and pornography and she got possessed with a demon and and she came to our church and um, a lot of the pastors didn't even know she had a demon in her and they were just going to pray for her because they thought she was being oppressed, which she was. But then I walked in the room because my dad told me to go down and meet with her and I looked at her and the Holy Spirit told me she had a demon. So I just, in the middle of the meeting, I just looked at her and I said, what's your name on clean spirit? And she manifested and over about 20 minutes of her, us praying for her, reading the Bible to her and getting words of knowledge of what was going on in her life. Uh, the demon was telling her that she was going to be rich through prostituting her body. And that was a word of knowledge that one of my friends got. So he looked at her and goes, did this demon tell you that you were going to be rich through prostituting your body? And she looked like a deer in headlights. And she said, how'd you know that? And we said, because the Holy Spirit's telling us what's going on in your life. And she goes, what do I do? And I said, you need to repent of your sins. And she repented and we casted the demon out of her. And that was a 15 year old girl. Wow. So, I mean, I got a radio show that talks about all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, but, um, 
yeah, the stories go on and on and on. Um, there was another story. I'll tell you one last story. There was a story in New York City. Um, I was actually um, at Calvary Chapel uh, Yonkers in, in New York, and they were holding a youth event, and the youth pastor, which was a, a New York PD, he says, we have a – actually, you know, you might want to leave that out of the story because I don't want to call – I don't I don't want to uh, – people to know the exact kid. Mm-hmm. But there was a church in New York, and the youth pastor said there was a kid that they found on – the parents found on his phone that he was looking up way to, ways to murder his parents. And he was – he had a bunch of crazy dark video games, and he was watching pornography – and they brought me to the kid and the dad was an atheist and the mom was a Christian and they brought the kid to me and I sat down with the kid. And after just looking at him, I, I, uh, I, I realized he didn't have a demon in him, but he was being seriously oppressed. And I said, look, man, I said, do you want to be set free? Because Jesus can set you free and you could have joy and you could be happy or you could be miserable and, and be in this darkness and he ended up uh, confessing his sins, repenting, and then I prayed over him that he would that that all the doors would close and that he would be set free. And literally, after that, he within like a couple minutes, he started smiling and he had all this joy. And he walked away from the table and he was running around with all the kids having a good time. And the dad walked up to me and goes, "What did you do to my kid?" He goes, it, "In the last three years, I have not seen my kid smile." He's had no energy. He's just been like literally depressed. And now he's literally running around interacting with kids, which he hasn't interacted with people for three years. And I said, Jesus, the ego, he repented of his sins and he was being demonically oppressed and he got set free. And now that's he's filled with the spirit. He has God in him now. Right. Mm -hmm. And his dad was just dumbfounded. And his, his mom, the mom was a Christian, so she knew. But yeah. I mean, wow, these the are the stories over and over and over. Yeah. You know. So you've talked a little I, bit I, about, oh, go ahead. Um, I want to say one last, one, I'm going to plug one more last story because this yeah. is going to kind of paint the story of the revival night, why it's needed. Mm. Um, Calvary Chapel, Delaware. I was out there preaching and this kid came up to me. He was 15 years old and he said, Ryan, when you were talking about pornography, he says, I want you to pray for me. He goes, I'm, 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 uh, he goes, I started watching porn on a phone at like 12 or 11 or 12 years old. And he goes, now I'm 15 years old. And he goes, now I'm gay. I go, well, when do you, when do you, when, what part of your life did you become gay? He goes, I was never gay. He goes, but the progression of pornography that I was watching got more hardcore and hardcore. And he goes, now all I watch is gay porn. Mm-hmm. And this is a kid that was raised in the Christian school. At, the, at Calvary Chapel, Delaware, in their Christian school and a Christian kid in the school. But because of the progression and because the eye is the light to the body, if the light that you think you have is actually darkness, how great is that darkness? Mm-hmm. This kid thought he had the light, but the progression of what he was watching led him to homosexuality porn, and now he's gay. Wow. So this is why, this is why over the years of all these stories that I come in contact with these kids, and adults, likewise, that are in this situation, this is why I decided to start the revival night. God has led me to do it in the church because we are living in a time where the church is jacked up. And it has nothing to do with the pastor teaching amazing messages. This is just what's happening behind the scenes, the riffraff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love this. You know, you talked about, like, the inreach earlier, and I think that most of the time when we think about missions work, we think about outreach, you know, we think about evangelizing or missions work. And so I think that this idea of having the, having the missions be the people in the church that are just drifting away is just, it's very important. Um, you've talked a little bit about the the bottom line. So I'm going to just jump in here really quick. The the bottom line is that like, I'm, I'm an evangelist and God, I I was raised in the church, so I know that world. But then I was I was very caught up in the world, you know. I, and people that don't know, I was I was working in the music and skateboard industry my whole life. 
I was having demonic stuff happen in my life. Entities show up in my room, choking me out. I was using a lot of drugs. I've I've seen the other side. I was watching pornography. I was sleeping around. I was involved in all this stuff. So when I got set free, I know the dark side. I know what it all entails. This is no, I'm no stranger to to the enemy and the dark side and what he brings on when you're living in the darkness. I've also crossed over from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So now I also know the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. This is why God has called me to be an evangelist. I have a unique message that I'm able to cut through all the fluff and get down to the heart issue of what's going on with people. And this is the message. This is why this revival night is so potent because it's, we are, I have a different message than the pastors. The pastors, the pastors are discipling. They're bringing the word of God. But as we know, Chuck Smith knows that there's evangelistic messages and then there's Bible teaching messages. This is why the revival night is so unique. It's an evangelistic in reach, but also has an outreach component to invite people. Mm. It's, it's unique. It's unique to what it is for this time in the Calvary Chapel movement. As you were talking, I couldn't help flash back to 25 years ago and being an El Segreto. And well, all the pastors I just met on my first trip for Calvary Chapel magazine and uh, Rawl crying for his son that he was afraid was going to die soon from an overdose. And he was praying yep. for a praying for a miracle. And it's like, wow, didn't God answer that prayer? And and you know what, Tom, the culture that we're living in, the amount of, oh, I mean, I'm not even like, I don't even know all the statistics about fat and all this crazy stuff that's going on. But I can't tell you how many parents have come up to me that have lost their sons, that they're smoking weed, but they are laced with fentanyl. They don't even know it. Right. And there is so many overdoses happening Um these are these are just like on accident overdoses, and then there's actually people that are actually trying to party hard, you know, mm-hmm. doing it. We are living in the most radical times. It's 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 really it's really insane, you know, the times that we're living in. Yeah. So uh, probably <clears throat> if a young Ryan Reese twenty five years ago, if the drugs had been as strong and crazy as they are right now, you wouldn't be alive. Yeah. I would not be alive. There's yeah. no way. Me and my friends, we, we say, we go, man, the way it is now, it's not even safe to, to go out and, and use drugs anymore. Like, not that drugs were safe back then, but now it's like, it's really, really, really risky. It's like Russian roulette, but with like five bullets. We're just really excited what you're doing, brother. Yeah. We're really Dude, excited. Dude, thank you. Thank you very much. And that that even goes along with like, all the pastors that have been picking it up, the revival night, they know the messaging. They know what they know the what's happening. You got Mike McClure, you got my dad, you got we've done a lot of work with Mike with McClure all through like that whole region up there in NorCal, like Sac, right. uh, what is it called, San Jose. San Jose you got yeah. you got uh, Don uh, Ron Hand down there in Texas. Yeah. Um, we're we're working. I mean, there's there's a lot of other people. Mexico's picking it up. We're going out to Germany. Um, uh, you know, I know we're going to be going out to Gary Hamrick's church as well. Uh, uh, Bob Giglione up in, uh, oh, yeah. Delaware County, yeah. Florida. Yeah. So it's, yeah. people know the need, the people that know the need that understand what's happening they're they're jumping on board, mm. you know, I'm bummed. I'm going to still be in, uh, Thailand when you're here at our church, I, I got guys shooting it, but just personally, yeah. I, it's like, you know, of course, if I had known you were coming, I would have tried to rearrange the trip, but I'm supposed to be at Calvary Chapel, Bangkok on that Sunday. So I've already obligated myself. So how is Calvary Chapel, Bangkok? Is there things happening out there? Oh yeah, man. Well, they got the Far East Conference that's going to be in Chiang Mai. And and they got hundreds of people coming to that, even from China. Obviously, I can't take their pictures. They'll be scattering when they see the camera, you know. But I'll have to assure them that nothing will get in that shouldn't be in. But uh, and then oh, wow. uh, then they have a the work in Chiang Mai is is really it's a really international city, and so it's they they teach in English, but the one in in Bangkok is a total Ch- uh, Thai uh, Calvary Chapel 
and it's just, and they're reaching into the villages, and God's word is just being spread, you know, all over. But as, as long, I'm sure as time goes on, that they will need this because the enemy's not going to let this happen easily. He's going to be fighting yeah. all the way like you've been. You, you can look at someone that's literally a kid that can be demon-possessed, and they, they, the demon can be manifesting and just talking in a normal voice because they don't want to get discovered. Right. Like you have to be sensitive. Like, and then they just, and then people pray with them. Oh, we're just going to pray for you. Okay. Jesus help them. And they let them go and they leave demon possessed. This is, this is literally happened. I was in a room of pastors of four pastors and no one knew that she had a demon in her. And then I just called it out. She manifested right there in the middle of everyone. So like it's, it's, it's 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 happening, and again, I don't believe that everyone is demon possessed, but there are there are. I was I was telling this pastor over here in Emmett, uh, Emmett, California, Emmett, Idaho, about how to you know su- check and see if they have one, and that's what happened. There was this kid saying all this really bizarre, weird stuff and doing weird stuff at his vacation Bible school. He was like nine years old, and then he walked up, and and I said, just whisper in his ear. And he walked up and he goes, what's your name on clean spirit? And, and the kid manifested. That's how you can find out, you know, if because if, 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 the demon will manifest, you know. Mm. Um, anyway, and then you got the kid got set free. And that was that. Mm. So, but again, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the Ghostbusters. I don't want to. I'm just <laughs> saying that my, my point is uh, I don't look for it. I'm just saying that we are living in a time more radical than ever before. Um, they're just putting this this darkness in these kids. Wait till you look at the cartoons and stuff that I sent you. Yeah. The rainbow friends, they're all zombies. They're all zombie, like demonic looking twisted creatures. Um, and these kids are just watching this stuff. Mm. It's, 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 it's horrific. Ryan, what, how would you describe like the Holy spirit kind of demonstrating that to you? I know that you said that you were in the room of pastors with people and stuff like that. How would, how would you say that you knew that people were demon impressed? I, I just looked at her and I, the Holy Spirit just told me, I just, I just, he told me like she had a demon in her. Mm. That was it. Like I just knew, I just knew, I knew she wasn't acting weird or anything. She was, okay. she was literally just looking down, just like depressed. Mm. But, but I just knew that she had it. Any cases of like parents where you've seen this at the revival nights or anything, or is it more so just the youth? Well, this is the this is the first revival night, but there was uh, I mean yeah, there was parents. There was a there was a lady that came to me that was hearing voices at my dad's church when I was teaching there one time, and she says I'm hearing voices and they're telling me to commit suicide. So I prayed for her and I laid hands on her, and she wasn't demon possessed; she was demon oppressed. And I prayed that God would close the doors that have been opened, and that. God would set her free. And she came back three years later to me and said that she's a cop in the LAPD. And she was, she got set free that night. Um, there was another girl and there was another lady that, uh, that we, uh, she came up to me and told me that she had a demon in her. And, um, I, and she said that there were several pastors that have tried to cast the demon out of her. And I said, you know, I said, do you have any oil? And she had a big old jar of oil, uh, anointing oil. And I put, I, I put oil on her forehead and she just started manifesting, screaming. And very long story short, I was trying to cast the demon out for about 30 minutes. It wouldn't come out. And then I just started, I stopped and I just told everyone to start praying. And as I started praying in the spirit, um, I stopped and then I heard the Holy Spirit tell me unforgiveness. And, and I, I looked at her and I said, Hey, I said, do you have unforgiveness? Because this demon is not going to come out because there's a foot, there's a stronghold of unforgiveness. And she says, yes, I can't forgive my mom for everything she's ever done. And I said, you need to repent and you need to ask God to forgive you of the unforgiveness. And she did. And then I prayed and, and cast the demon out of her. And so it's good. You get words of knowledge. You get you know, uh, uh, discerning of spirits, you get the gifts start manifesting when you start getting in these situations mm. and you start and he, the Holy Spirit starts telling you what's going on in their life, how to get to the bottom of it. It always comes down to repentance. Mm. All roads lead to repentance. And then once they we find out the stronghold or the foothold that they're that the enemy has that that hook in them, then you expose it 
and then you repent of it, and then the demon has to leave. Do most of these people know that they're demon oppressed or demon possessed when this happens, or do they kind of figure um, it after? Um, some people don't know, and some people do know. Like that girl, like that girl. When I said, "Well, do you feel like something takes over your body?" and they go, "Yes." Well, mm-hmm. now she re- she didn't realize it was a demon, but she yeah. Some people know, and some people don't know. This is another way to check it. You go, well, do you feel like you're, it's like when you, when somebody takes over your body, it's like being in a car, you're being in your car, but you're, you're not, someone else is driving your car. It's like, that's the way the demon, they take over the body and they, they're, they're in your, they're, they're in your body, but you're not, you're, they're saying, they're talking. You hear your mouth talking, but you're not talking. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Wow. It's, that's, that's, that's the way, that's what people have told me when they are possessed, what it's like. They see everything, they experience it, unless they're like really, really demon possessed and they, sometimes they black out. Yeah, we cast a demon out of a cartel, a hitman for the cartel in Mexico, um, when we were down there probably like four, three years ago. That was a whole nother crazy story. He was speaking in English and he, it was, that was a, that was a really radical, that took about 10 of us to do that. Are there any other ways that you have seen the gospel kind of spread or move specifically in that um, other than kind of these testimonies of being people being set free from this oppression? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't want to like focus like the whole article on, yeah. on that. that. That was, I think that the reason why I wanted to say those, those things about those kids, because it's, it's painting the picture of showing that one kid from New York, the progression of pornography mm. led him to homosexuality from 11 to 15, like that fast. You know, you got these young kids, seven year old girl and a nine year old boy that are watching these cartoons, Five Nights at Freddy's, Poppy Playtime and Rainbow Friends, which are packaged for kids, but they're demonic. And now they're seeing dem- demonic stuff happening in their house. Like this is the stuff that's what's happening in the culture more than ever. Um, the other side of things, that's just that side. The other side of things, um, yeah, people are, people were getting baptized. I mean, they were going in in their full clothing. Like they didn't come to get baptized, but they ended yeah. up getting baptized. That's awesome. There was a lot of people that were saying, you know, I, I just, I haven't, I haven't been baptized, but I just feel like I just, feel like I got to get baptized now. Mm-hmm. Like now I got to make a public statement. I'm all in for God. I'm just, I want, I want to get really serious, really serious about God. They're not playing games anymore. So people Um, were hungry and ready for it. And people were, people were walking out of there saying they encountered God, like the Holy spirit encountered them. They were filled with the spirit. They were overflowed. They, they, they left there excited with joy. And it was just an incredible, an incredible event. I mean, this is, this is for the body of Christ. You know, Mm -hmm. there was, there was probably, a number of people that were dealing with serious darkness, but there was just a lot of people that just wanted to come to encounter God. It was a very edifying and encouraging message for people to get serious. And I told them at the end, I said, don't let this be a one night thing. Like get involved, go get plugged into a Bible school. If you can, you know, go, to, you know, get involved in your church ministry. Like get active about your faith. Don't, don't, this is not an emotional we don't want to like run by emotionalism, like oh yeah, a revival yeah. night. No, revival night night means for you to be awakened and then to go out and live that life that God called you to live. Yeah, one person that I know said that they put revival like this, um, turning away from sin and turning to the Lord, and I I thought that was a really good defin- definition. Also, um, that's it. It's 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 awakened, awakened out of the darkness from going from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And the only way you can do that is repent and cross over. Uh, Jesus said, walk in the light so the darkness will not overtake you. And that's through repentance, the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that will produce a personal revival, an awakening, a renewal. Mm. It, that's what it all comes down to is literally full surrender to Christ through repentance and crossing over. That's the only way you're going to have. It's, it comes down to a personal revival, taking it back to the seventies, you were seeing, people were like, oh, we're in the middle of a revival. Well, a revival is a personal awakening. Mm. So what you were seeing, it was a mass movement 
of people repenting at one time. Earlier you said that people were kind of encountering God. Do you want to kind of elaborate on what that looked like? Like, what, do you, what yeah. did you mean by that, kind of? I believe that people were coming there, and God was, God was speaking to them. He was, they were coming with questions, things in their mind that they had, and God was speaking to them. He was picking them off one by one and answering questions and, and confirming things maybe that he was putting in their heart or their mind pre-event or things that they were praying about. He, he, he meets people uniquely. During worship, he meets them through the message. He meets them through the time of prayer. For instance, the way God meets people is like there was a there was this lesbian uh, girl that was married that was that was coming to uh, our study for 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 a while, and she she says I'm a lesbian, I'm married, and she was coming to the church and hearing like repentance messages for about two years. Mm. There was no change besides the fact that she ended up getting divorced for whatever reason. And then one night during worship, she was in the back of the church and God spoke to her, spoke to her during the worship message. And she ended up during just during worship, not even the message. And she repented of her sins and gave her life to Christ. Mm. So God meets people through worship. He speaks to them just to wherever they're at in the service. And after through prayer, through people, God meets people. And do you guys do like worship? Good worship and a strong message. And then we're going to count on the Holy Spirit to just do what he does. Mm. It's, it's very simple. The messaging, it's an evangelistic Bible teaching for such a time as this. It's, it's combating the things of the culture. It's relevant to the times. Mm. That's the difference. I'm, I'm saying with what a lot of people don't are scared to say. Yeah. That's, that's the difference, and that's where God has called me. And that's why we're seeing the response of what's happening in this time. Is there anything else, Ryan, that you kind of want to just talk about before we kind of conclude here that maybe we didn't touch on or that I didn't ask today? Um, well, I can tell you this. After, after we did the revival night at my dad's church, we, we saw a lot more people in his church all three services wow like the following sunday there, the next there was a there there was a there was a big influx wow the after effect is it wasn't just a one night thing and my dad just called me again last sunday he goes peter our church is packed and i was like awesome <laughs> praise the lord yeah and he said it's a bunch of young people he's like it's packed with young people so that's that's what revival is about i mean just going back to our roots 65 years ago you know it's not, I'm not recreating the wheel. I'm just like, this is what God is doing. You know, he's just doing this right now.